Welcome to chapter 11. This chapter is on loneliness and solitude. So the objectives of this chapter are to come to appreciate the value of loneliness and solitude. Uh, we also want to explore our fear of loneliness. Many of us have that. We want to understand loneliness during a time of increased connectivity now that we're all on social media and technology allows us to connect with people all over the world. Um, why are people so lonely? We want to understand the meaning of shyness. Uh, this chapter will also help us to provide um, an overview of loneliness at various life stages. So as we age um, in our middle adulthood, and then finally, we want to appreciate the importance of time alone as a source of creativity. So let's dive in. Okay, so loneliness is defined as an emotional state that occurs when we have fewer social relationships than we want or when our relationships are not satisfying. So loneliness can be triggered by death of a loved one, a breakup, a move, an extended hospital stay. Um, and really the, the main thing that loneliness does is it creates a feeling of being isolated, detached, disconnected from others. There's also something called solitude, um, and solitude is time alone to discover who we are and to renew ourselves. So solitude is about consciously deciding to take time alone and really be introspective. Um, so we could sit quietly with our thoughts or we can meditate. Um, and solitude is really necessary in order to feel centered and balanced as a person. If we are comfortable being alone, then we don't need to depend on others to fulfill us. So in relationships, we're uh, able to offer something to the relationship rather than depending on someone else to fulfill us in some way. Um, another thing is that our society overschedules and really stimulates children in a way that's kind of too much. And this makes them impatient, easily bored, and anxious, research shows. So we want to maybe teach them about solitude um, at an early age, which is just, um, you know, it, it would need to be age appropriate. So for a child, just allowing them to experience quiet time each day, turn off all the screens, all the noise, and let them sit quietly with a book or let them play with their toys quietly. Um, but, you know, a lot of people avoid solitude. And reasons that we do that is because, one, other people might think it's weird. Um, worried people, so we, we worry that people might think that we are odd or sick or depressed if we want to be alone. Um, other reasons that we avoid solitude include that maybe it makes other people feel threatened. Um, maybe if we are spending time alone, that means that we don't want to spend time with them or that we have less affection for them. Um, and then we also kind of have obligations to others, and so sometimes we feel guilty for taking time alone. We also might have a fear of alienate, alienating others. Um, we might be worried that we could lose friends or become less close to people if we spend time away from them. And then finally, we might avoid solitude because we have a fear of ourselves. We might be worried that we could find out things about ourselves that we didn't know or don't want to know or don't want to deal with, don't want to face, aren't ready to deal with. Um, the Dalai Lama says that to make changes in our lives, we need solitude. We need a mental state free of distractions to really be able to grow as people. So that's kind of why we're talking about this concept of loneliness and solitude in this chapter, is how can we use time alone to really benefit us and help us to develop as people. So with that being said, let's go ahead and watch a video on um, why people feel lonely at all. <laughs> This is Michael. Hi. He's 31 years old, lives in a major US city, went to college and earned $60,000 a year. He's the most common demographic you'll find on online dating. And he's kind of lonely. Actually, really lonely. <sighs> so pepper lonely. But why do we feel lonely? First of all, there's something we need to clear up. Michael is lonely and he's also alone. Oh man. But there are lots of people who choose to be alone and are not necessarily lonely. It's not a bad thing. 
Some suggest that solitude is essential for creativity and it can help improve your attention span. But Michael doesn't feel that way. <sighs> and some of us are prone to feel just like Michael. Recent studies have linked loneliness to our genes. Huh? People with certain genetic markers, namely a variant of the serotonin transporter gene, will feel lonelier than people without this genetic marker when they're in the same situation. Loneliness causes a yearning for social connection in the same way hunger makes us crave food. If Michael is genetically predispositioned to feel lonely, then he's just really hungry for company. But he's not the most isolated person. Really? This honour goes to the seven Apollo Command Module pilots who orbited the moon alone while their fellow astronauts walked on the surface. Al Warden, the Apollo 15 pilot, was, at times, 3,600 kilometres away from his colleagues Dave Scott and Jim Irwin in the Imbrium Basin. Al was the most isolated person ever. He spent three days alone in orbit, hundreds of thousands of kilometres away from his home and often out of contact with those on Earth. And Al enjoyed it. He said, there's a thing about being alone and there's a thing about being lonely, and they're two different things. I was alone, but I was not lonely. On the backside of the moon, I didn't even have to talk to Houston, and that was the best part of the flight. Be but being alone for long periods of time isn't so out of this world, even if you enjoy it. One study found that actual social isolation increased people's likelihood of death by 26%, even when people didn't consider themselves lonely. Isolated people don't have others around to give them advice, make sure they see a doctor or be there when things go wrong. Being alone is a biological alarm bell. We're a social species. But if you're struggling for company, a healthy dose of nostalgia can counteract those lonely feels. So whether you sit on the Michael or Al side of the loneliness spectrum... Hey! Over here! Science says that surrounding yourself with others keeps you orbiting around the sun for more and more years to come. Hey everyone, it's Vanessa. I just wanted to pop in and say thank you so much for watching BrainCraft. Okay, so one of the ways that we feel lonely is when our relationships are not fulfilling. So we might actually have people in our lives, but we might not feel validated or heard by them. Another way we feel lonely is when we are disconnected from our inner selves. Um, so being lonely is actually a part of the human experience, and we can learn a lot about ourselves during times of loneliness if we're willing to confront uh, ourselves and our fears and our uh, worries and what pains us. Um, and so if we're willing to confront those things in times of loneliness and deal with it, then we can uh, really gain a lot of self-awareness. So there are different types of loneliness. The first type of loneliness is called transient loneliness. And these are brief feelings of loneliness that occur when people experience some disruption in their social network, such as the breakup of a relationship or moving. Um, so this type of loneliness will only last for a certain um, amount of time and then usually we're able to move on. The next type of loneliness is chronic loneliness. And this is the inability to establish meaningful interpersonal relationships over a relatively long period of time. So this type of loneliness can be incredibly painful and make it difficult to function, um, to go to work, to feel um, okay, to feel happy. So people with this type of loneliness are often shy, they have poor social skills, and they have self-defeating thoughts. Uh, meaning that they kind of say nasty things to themselves, like I can't do it, or I'm not worthy, or I'm hopeless, I'm helpless, things like that. And then there is everyday loneliness, and this is the pain of being isolated from other people. So people with this type of loneliness usually have a fear of intimacy. They might have feelings of shame, or a fear of rejection, or a fear that they are, for some reason, unlovable. And then the last type of loneliness is existential loneliness, and this is a profound sense of the unbridgeable gap that separates us from others. 
So it's the understanding that we have a whole existence going on inside our minds, thoughts that we tell ourselves, mental images that we're creating, memories, stories, and no one else can see this. Um, and as we age, we may experience this type of loneliness more as we realize that we are approaching death and we realize that the world of our minds is going to disappear. It's not going to exist anymore. No one will have seen it. Uh, and no one will see it going forward. And that might make some people feel as if they're facing death in a very um, alone way or in a very lonely way. Okay, so let's watch a video on why we are fated to be alone or why, um, as I said earlier, being lonely is just a part of the human experience. There are few more shameful confessions to make than that we are lonely. The basic assumption is that no respectable person could ever feel isolated unless maybe they had just moved country or been widowed. Yet in truth, a high degree of loneliness is an inexorable part of being a sensitive, intelligent human. It's a built-in feature of a complex existence. There are several big reasons for this. Much of what we need recognized and confirmed by others, a lot of what it would be extremely comforting to share, is going to be disturbing to society at large. Many of the ideas in the recesses of our minds are too odd, contrary, subtle or alarming to be safely revealed to anyone else. We face a choice between honesty and acceptability and, understandably, mostly choose the latter. It takes a lot of energy to listen to another person and enter sympathetically into their experiences. We shouldn't blame others for their failure to focus on who we are. They may want to meet us, but we should accept the energy with which they will keep the topic of their own lives at the centre of the conversation. We must all die alone, which really means that our pain is for us alone to endure. Others can throw us words of encouragement, but in every life, we are out on the ocean, drowning in the swell, and others, even the nice ones, are standing on the shore, waving cheerily. It's deeply unlikely that we will ever find someone on exactly the same page of the soul as us. We will long for utter congruity, but there will be constant dissonance because we appeared on the earth at different times, are the product of different families and experiences, and are just not made of quite the same fabric. So they won't be thinking just the same as us on coming out of the cinema and looking out at the night sky. Just when we want them to say something high-flown and beautiful, they will perhaps be remembering a painfully banal and untimely detail from an area of domestic life, or vice versa. It is almost comic. We will almost certainly never meet the people best qualified to understand us. But they do exist. Probably they once walked past us in the street, though neither of us had the slightest idea of the potential for connection. Or maybe they died in Sydney two weeks ago or won't be born until the 22nd century. It isn't a conspiracy. We would just have needed a lot more luck. The problem is sure to get worse the more thoughtful and perceptive we are. There will simply be less people like us around. It isn't a romantic myth. Loneliness truly is a kind of tax we have to pay to atone for a certain complexity of mind. The desire to undress someone is for a long time far more urgent than the desire for good conversation. And so we end up locked in relationships with certain people we don't have much to say to because we were once fatefully interested in the shape of their nose or the colour of their remarkable eyes. And yet, despite all this, we shouldn't be frightened or discomforted by our pervasive loneliness. At an exasperated moment, near the end of his life, the German writer Goethe, who appeared to have had a lot of friends, exploded bitterly, No one has ever properly understood me. I have never fully understood anyone. No one understands anyone else. It was a helpful outburst from such a great man. It isn't our fault. A degree of distance and mutual incomprehension isn't a sign that life has gone wrong. It's what we should expect from the very start. And when we do, benefits can follow. Once we accept loneliness, we can get creative. 
We can start to send out messages in a bottle. We can sing, write poetry, produce books and blogs, activities stemming from the realization that people around us won't ever fully get us, but that others, separated across time and space, might just. The history of art is the record of people who couldn't find anyone in the vicinity to talk to. And we can take up the coded offer of intimacy in, say, the words of a Roman poet who died in 10 BC, or the lyrics of a singer who described just our blues in a recording from Nashville in 1963. Loneliness makes us more capable of true intimacy, if ever better opportunities do come along. It heightens the conversations we have with ourselves. It gives us a character. We don't repeat what everyone else thinks. We develop a point of view. We might be isolated for now, but we'll be capable of far closer, more interesting bonds with anyone we do eventually locate. Loneliness renders us elegant and strangely alluring. It suggests there's more about us to understand than the normal patterns of social intercourse can accommodate, which is something we can take pride in. A sense of isolation truly is, as we suspect but usually prevent ourselves from feeling, from fear of arrogance, a sign of depth. When we admit our loneliness, we are signing up to a club that includes the people we know from the paintings of Edward Hopper, the poems of Baudelaire, and the songs of Leonard Cohen. Lonely, we enter a long and grand tradition. We find ourselves, surprisingly, in great company. Enduring loneliness is almost invariably better than suffering the compromises of false community. Loneliness is simply a price we may have to pay for holding on to a sincere, ambitious view of what companionship must and could be. So more than ever, people are able to connect with a lot of people in a lot of different places all around the world just by being at home. Um, and so we certainly are more connected to each other in some ways by using social media. Um, but with everything, there are pros and cons. So let's talk about the effect of social media on our relationships and on our sense of loneliness. So some researchers argue that social media does connect us, and others argue that social media actually isolates us. We can talk to more people, but the quality of those interactions may not make us feel connected. Um, many people are more interested in the quantity of friends versus the quality of friendships. They're interested in the number of followers they have or the number of likes they have but not necessarily in the depth of conversation or the connectedness and bondedness that they feel to those people. So we can spend so much time on social media that we don't actually have time for face-to-face -face interaction. Um, and then another thing that researchers are seeing is even when we are face-to-face -face with people we're in relationships, sometimes we just end up on our phones, being on social media, ignoring that person uh, anyways. So researchers found that shy people without social support spent uh, the most amount of time on Facebook. And people that reported feeling connected to others tended to share their views and their opinions and kind of more um, in-depth ideas on their walls. And people that reported feeling lonely tended to share personal information relationship information, and even their address, which of course researchers cited as being extremely dangerous. Um, and then people with a low number of friends may feel less successful socially, and therefore they may end up feeling more lonely. So let's watch a video on the effects of social media on loneliness. This episode of D News is brought to you by Audible. Is Facebook making you sad and lonely? The good news is you're not alone. The bad news is you kind of are, just, you know, by definition.
Hey guys, Tara here for D News, and if you spend any time on Facebook, then you probably have that one friend or maybe several friends who posts way too much and overshare everything. Maybe you are that guy. Hey, I'm not here to judge. And while most of us are inclined to believe that boredom is what causes people to do that, it turns out the real reason may be much darker. A new study from researchers at Charles Sturt University in New South Wales finds that people who post excessive amounts on Facebook, including personal information, tend to be more lonely and depressed than people who don't. Researchers looked at data from 616 female Facebook users with public profiles Half of them were categorized as connected, meaning they placed more value on face-to-face -face relationships, and the other half were women who would describe themselves as lonely in their latest Facebook wall posting. The goal was to see if there was some kind of correlation between self-described loneliness and the amount of information that one is willing to disclose on social media sites. Turns out there is a correlation. Personal information, which includes things like your favorite books, movies, quotations, etc., were publicly shared by 79% of women who describe themselves as lonely, compared to only 65% of connected users. And this pattern extends to highly personal information as well. Almost 98% of these self-described lonely Facebookers had publicly shared their relationship status on Facebook, and they were also significantly more likely than others to publicly post their home address. Personally, I can't imagine why any woman would want to publicly share her home address on Facebook, but it happens, and researchers say that intimate levels of disclosure like that could point to signs of real-life emotional stress. The author of the study, Yeslam al sagaf says it makes sense that people who are lonely would disclose such information because it makes it easier for others to initiate contact with them, which may help them overcome their feelings of loneliness. Facebook depression is by no means a new concept. A study published earlier this year in the journal Social Influence found that many people's emotional health actually declined when they were being ignored on Facebook, with some users describing that their existence actually felt less meaningful when others did not like or share their statuses and comments. A different study from 2011 found that an overdependence on social networks can be harmful to one's physical and emotional health. It leaves people with feelings of loneliness and it increases the social pressure to prove something to their online friends. I have been a Facebook user for almost a decade now, and this may have more to do with my age than anything else, but definitely seems like less of an emotional outlet now and more of a bragging tool where people just post all of the awesome things that happen to them, which I get. You don't want to be the guy who fills up your feed with nothing but negativity, but I can also see why it leads to a culture of jealousy and competition. Especially with sites like Facebook and Instagram now focusing more on photo sharing, it makes it so easy to glance at someone's profile and envision that their lives are so much more glamorous than yours, even when they aren't. But again, that is just my experience. I am sure it varies a lot by age and location and all kinds of stuff that science has not yet predicted, so I expect we will be seeing a lot more studies like this in the future. And hey, if Facebook is making you lonely and depressed, then just take a break. Get off the computer and read a book, or better yet, get on the computer and download a book. Audible.com is the leading provider of digital audiobooks, so if you need any cure for boredom, they have you covered. Audible has over 100,000 titles to choose from in every genre, from sci-fi to drama to comedy to business. Just download them to your iPod or MP3 player and you can play them back anywhere, anytime. Better yet, you can get a free audiobook download of your choice and support DNews in the process by signing up at audiblepodcast.com slash DNews. And if you need recommendations, you should check out The Martian by Andy Weir. It's a fascinating novel about an astronaut who gets stranded on Mars and has to figure out how to survive there alone for four years. It's fiction, obviously, but it is absolutely worth reading. In the meantime, if you guys have questions, comments, or maybe some fun anecdotes about Facebook, just let us know in the comments. Otherwise, thanks for watching. Okay, so for lecture activity number one for chapter 11, I'd like you to tell me what you think. Is technology contributing to our isolation and loneliness, or is it bringing us close together? Uh, closer together. So give me two to three sentences on that for lecture activity one. Is technology contributing to our isolation or is it bringing us closer together? So it's important that we learn to confront the fear of loneliness for our personal and social adjustment. Um, we know that long-term loneliness influences physical and psychological well-being. Um, people that have experienced loneliness in the long term are more prone to depression, drug use, they're at a higher risk for heart disease, 
um, they have a shorter lifespan and they're more likely to have recurrent illnesses. So it is some, uh, it is appropriate to have some fear of loneliness, um, but we don't want to have excessive fear and we also want to be able to cope with loneliness so that we don't have these negative side effects. <clears throat> so fear of loneliness can be derived from our associations, uh, connections that we make kind of mentally. So we might associate being alone not with an opportunity to gain self-awareness, but instead with being lonely, with being isolated from others. Associating loneliness with periods of uh, in life with emotional suffering and associate being alone with rejection is another way in which we can create a fear of loneliness. Um, and then this can cause us to develop a fear of rejection, which prevents us from reaching out to others or opening up in relationships, which ultimately makes us feel lonely. So it's kind of a vicious cycle. People use all kinds of different methods to avoid feeling alone. Um, things as simple as when you get home and no one's there, just turning on the TV um, so that there's some background noise, even if you're not watching it, or when you're driving, um, not being able to sit in silence, having to have the radio on, or having to talk on the phone. Not that those things are bad. Like I like to listen to the radio when I drive too, but can you sit there without the radio on and feel comfortable? You should try it. It's an interesting experiment. Other methods that people use are to overschedule themselves, stay constantly busy, uh, try to control every aspect of their lives, constantly surround themselves with people. Um, some people might turn to alcohol and drugs to avoid feeling alone. They might overeat. Um, excessive use of TV, computer, video games, social media, things like that. So, uh, so loneliness is often a product of the alienation of ourselves, specifically from others, um, but also uh, alienating ourselves from our true inner authentic self. Sometimes people that are feeling lonely try to present themselves like they're not feeling lonely, uh, which actually just makes them feel more lonely and disconnected from others um, because they're not feeling like they're really being seen as a person. And then some people will just kind of cling to someone else to avoid their feelings of being lonely. Um, so being like very needy and clingy and attached. And this can make us feel less connected to ourselves um, because we're kind of like globbing onto this other person person and kind of ignoring ourselves and that actually ends us ends up making us feel more alone too so the moral of the story is that we need to confront and deal with our fears of being alone to kind of be our best selves let's talk about some of the feelings of loneliness that can accompany being shy um, so shyness is defined as feelings of anxiety discomfort inhibition and excessive caution in interpersonal relationships. People that are shy feel extremely uncomfortable in social settings. Um, and characteristics of shy people include that they might be scared to express themselves. They might be overly sensitive to how they are being perceived. Um, they might embarrass easily. And then there's a range of bodily symptoms that they experience as well. Um, blushing, upset stomach, anxiety. So 4 out of 10 people report being shy on a consistent basis, but it's important to note that shyness exists on a continuum from non-problematic ordinary shyness to extreme shyness. And ordinary shyness is being shy in specific limited situations occasionally from time to time. I know I've experienced that before, like if I go to a party and I don't know anyone, um, I can feel shy uh, on certain days when I'm in that situation. But extreme shyness, which is at the other end of the continuum, can be debilitating and painful. Uh, shy people are usually uncomfortable in social situations. They are uncomfortable being the center of attention. They're uncomfortable around authority figures, around someone they find attractive. Um, and they are uncomfortable when they are expected to speak up any type of public speaking um, it can be very terrifying for a person that struggles with shyness. Um, sometimes they are perceived as arrogant, aloof, and uninterested in other people. So there's a whole host of factors that lead to shyness. Um, being overly sensitive to negative feedback, fearing rejection, 
lacking self-confidence and social skills, being frightened of intimacy. And it's important to note that being an introvert does not necessarily make you a shy person. Um, I am, in fact, an introvert, but I would not consider myself to be a shy person. Um, an introvert is, and an extrovert is often misunderstood. So an introvert is someone who uh, just doesn't need a lot of social stimulation and prefers to be alone. And an extrovert is someone who is really energized by a lot of social stimulation. But it's possible for an extrovert to be shy, um, but just like to be around people um, and they kind of get um, a lot of fulfillment by being around others, where introverts tend to kind of feel drained from being around others, although they might enjoy themselves and like the people they're around. It's just the way that their um, brain kind of reacts to that social stimulation. So not all introverts are shy because they don't fear being around people. They just value alone time and, like I said, are more drained by social action uh, interaction than energized by it. So some of the consequences of shyness are that shyness can be a social and psychological handicap. Um, it prevents people from expressing their views. It can prevent people for, from speaking up for their rights. Um, it can make it difficult for them to think and communicate effectively. It can be difficult for them to make friends. Um, shyness can result in depression, anxiety, and loneliness or social anxiety disorder. So social anxiety disorder is severe shyness that interferes with life goals and may lead to learned pessimism, uh, pessimism, which is just kind of looking at everything in a really negative light and expecting negative outcomes to happen all the time um, rather than kind of being hopeful and uh, looking for the positive in situations. Um, if you have social anxiety, it's you're you're kind of more likely to just expect the worst all the time. So let's watch a video now on social anxiety disorder. Fact about me: as a child, I was so shy. I didn't answer the telephone until I was like 12 years old, and the first time I did, I answered it. Hello. And then I froze. I completely froze. And the person got so mad on the other line and just started saying, Hello? Hello? Who is this? Hello? And then I just hung up the phone. <laughs> Do you think you could do a video on shyness and social anxiety? Well, yes, because you're watching it. This is actually something that psychologists and scientists are still trying to puzzle out in terms of where shyness ends and social phobia begins. When it comes to social phobia or social anxiety, around 15% of people would probably meet the qualifications for that. Unlike just general shyness, social phobia or social anxiety as it's better known is something that is listed in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Psychiatric Disorders. It is a recognized clinical condition. I also wanted to talk about this side note for a moment because of a comment trend that I noticed watching video youtuber videos talking about their own social anxiety terming it social anxiety from people like Zoella and Beauty Crush. There's a lot of contention that quickly crops up in comments about oh well what they're dealing with is nothing compared to what I'm dealing with and they just need to shut up because they're just minimizing the problems that I'm experiencing and a lot of like negativity almost social anxiety one-upmanship that I would encourage you all to not engage in. People who are doing that want their experiences validated and I will say right now your experiences and your emotions surrounding social interaction and avoidance thereof are absolutely valid. Picking a fight in a comment section is simply not worth anyone's time. When it comes to this interaction of shyness and social anxiety, a lot of the research that I read suggested that we think of it more on a spectrum. I have come to realize that while I often reference my own social anxiety just kind of as a, a general term, I don't think I could fit the qualifications for social phobia. I am very shy. I also deal with generalized anxiety and the two meet. If I am going to hang out with someone whom I might not, might just be at an acquaintance level, I'm not super duper comfortable with you, I will be practicing talking points in my head possibly days beforehand. I will get really nervous. I will 
will experience a flush when I start to talk to you. The big difference when it comes to shyness and social phobia is more of how it impacts you behaviorally. Based on the studies and articles that I read about the science of shyness and social phobia, there were five big differences between the two that jumped out to me. First one being that people who have social phobia, social anxiety, usually report more social fears, common things like public speaking or being in classroom situations, going to parties where you have to make small talk. Secondly, while people who are just shy and people who are socially anxious might have a lot of pre-socializing symptoms, a lot of that anxiety, there might be physical symptoms, you might get an upset stomach, avoidance is a big difference because shy people more often than not will still go through with whatever kind of situation they are dreading. People who have social anxiety are likelier to avoid those situations at all costs. The third big difference is reported quality of life. So people who describe themselves as shy tend to report having a better quality of life than people who are socially anxious or experience social phobia. Fourth, there is a heterogeneity of shyness. Shyness can describe so many more people in a way than social phobia. We use shyness to describe everything from uh, mislabeling what is simply introversion, and a lot of people who are introverted aren't actually shy, to people who have debilitating social phobias. And the fifth big difference comes down to actually performing in social situations. A lot of times people who are shy might be really nervous, but when it comes down to it, our small talk might be a little bit awkward and stilted, <laughs> but it usually is okay. People who are socially anxious usually don't perform as well. There are more physical symptoms that go along with that shyness. This is a real, true psychological condition and something that requires therapy sometimes and sometimes even medication to help our brains and our mouths <laughs> connect. And another big thing that jumped out to me though in reading about shyness and social anxiety is that we're still learning so much more about these two things and how they interact and what they really are and where they come from. We still have a lot to learn, not only in terms terms of how nature and nurture interact to produce social anxiety, but also how to overcome those kinds of things. Personally, one thing that I am trying to do more of in my life is make myself uncomfortable in the sense of putting myself in social situations that I kind of dread. It's really, really, really good practice if you are someone who is shy. I also recognize that there are socially anxious people out there who <laughs> to wear the advice of like, buck up and just get on out of the house. That's not gonna happen. Understanding how it works and the research that's out there and what scientists know and don't know can be helpful for understanding when those symptoms trigger what is going on biologically, physiologically, psychologically to make you feel all of those, all of those feels. Now, I need your help. I wanna know what your experience is with shyness, social anxiety, all those different things, what you think about the differentiation between these terms. What do you do to manage these kinds of things in your life? How do you maintain a high quality of life and also deal with social anxiety or shyness? Let me know in the comments below, and hey, ask me some questions. I need y'all's questions so I can answer them. Thanks everybody who watched and commented on last week's Ask Kristen video, teetotalers just want to have fun. Kimberly Allen said, as a non-drinker, when I attend parties, I hang around till it gets boring. So basically, when people are stumbling all over the place, unless I'm sober driving, in which case I try to find the cat or dog and hang out and play with them. Miranda Pilas offered this tip, volunteering to be the designated driver, in my experience, helps a lot to prevent social alienation at parties. People then generally praise and respect you for making sure your friends got home safely at the end of the night. Thanks everybody. Ah, kisses. Ah, kisses. Who are you? Okay, so if you are interested in overcoming shyness or know someone that might be, some of the things that you can do that would help is to become aware of examining and changing your thinking about yourself and your shyness. So put yourself in social situations and force yourself to interact. Stop negative self-talk. Uh, keep a journal so that you can become kind of more self-aware, um, particularly as it um, pertains to like the things that you're saying to yourself. Um, there is something called the social fitness model, and this is a way to help shy individuals 
develop their capacities to enjoy so social situations. So it's a form of therapy that helps um, people that are shy to in enjoy interacting with others. And this model actually argues that social fitness, like physical fitness, is something you need to work on and can be improved through exercise. Um, so exercise might include spending more time socializing, meeting new people, changing your negative beliefs or your pessimistic attitude. And it's based on a cyclical model, uh, like you see here on the slide, where the shy person fears they're going to be judged negatively. This then leads to shame and self-blame for their shyness. Um, often then they feel like others are irritated with them um, for, for them not talking. Um, and then this leads them to feel angry and resentful to those people that aren't really understanding them. Um, and so blaming others then allows them to take the blame off of themselves and uh, relieve some of that shame that they're feeling. Um, but none of this is very helpful in overcoming your uh, shyness. So the best thing that you can do if you're shy is uh, push yourself um, in a variety of ways in, in your thoughts and your feelings and in your actions. So control what you're saying to yourself, control your feelings, um, and then control who you're talking to and who you're spending time with um, and get, get out there and meet some new people. Um, and so those are all tips for overcoming shyness. Okay, let's watch a video now on why shyness may not be so bad. Hi guys, I'm Joy and I'm here today to doodle the benefits of being shy. This video is based on the article, Shyness, it might not be such a negative thing, by Christina Chan. I, myself, am quite a shy person and often find it hard to approach others and strike up a conversation. First off, being shy is not the same thing as being introverted. Being shy is like feeling bashful and timid, while being introverted is choosing to be more reserved. While being shy usually has a negative connotation, it can also have its perks. 1. Modesty is attractive. Shy people don't like bragging about their success or accomplishments and they may downsize compliments or their own positive characteristics. 2. Cautious. Shy people look before they leap, plan for the unexpected, avoid unnecessary risk, and set long-term goals. They live with morals instead of being rebellious, so authority figures probably trust them to make the right decisions. 3. Sensitive to detail. Shy people are detail-oriented because they're sensitive to simulation, this leads to a great appreciation for fine details. For example, they might hate roller coasters, which causes a lot of simulation, but they will likely notice all the different flavors in a meal. 4. Approachable Shyness is rarely a threatening characteristic to people, and it's easier to approach a shy person than to approach a social butterfly. Additionally, most shy people don't have a stuck-up attitude. 5. Calming effect on others Shy people give off a peaceful vibe, especially in a very upbeat environment. Their calmness and ability to not be dramatic may have a positive effect on others. 6. Human service positions and empathy. Shy people are extremely sensitive to the feelings and emotions of others, so they excel in human service, such as being a psychologist or teacher. They are great listeners who people can easily open up to. Shy leaders are sometimes more effective than extroverted leaders because they talk less and listen more. 7. More trustworthy. Shy people don't gossip much or brag. People can trust them with keeping secrets. 8. Deeper friendships. The few friendships shy people possess are usually deep, long-lasting ones. Making friends probably isn't easy for them, so when they do find a friend, they value them greatly and work to maintain the relationship. 9. Successful at solitary work A majority of jobs require focus and concentration in a solitary environment, such as being an accountant, clinical work, or a lab technician. This is where shy people thrive. Because they aren't very social, a place with less distractions and interruptions allows them to perform exceptionally. Now that you know the positive sides to being shy, what is your opinion? Do you think being shy is more beneficial than being outgoing? 
If you consider yourself outgoing, are there any times you wish you were shy? Comment your answers down below. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel if you enjoy our content, and follow us on our Tumblr, Twitter, and Facebook. Thanks for watching. Okay, so uh, for our, our personal and social adjustment, it can be helpful to think about the impact loneliness had on us um, as we've gone through the different stages of our lives. Um, so we can, for example, review childhood experiences of loneliness, um, and that might help us to realize our current fears and like strategies that we use to defend ourselves from loneliness. Um, so, for example, there's a man that stuttered during a speech when he was a kid, and all the kids laughed at him for stuttering, and of course that made him feel very, like, isolated and singled out and lonely. Um, and he says that from that one experience as an adult, he feels, like, less confident than he did as a kid prior to that speech, and he doesn't speak as much, he hates public speaking, um, if he has something to say, he'd rather just keep it to himself. Um, and so all of those fears that he has as an adult really stem from just that one experience in childhood. So it's important to think back on your own childhood. I mean, was there like a day where you didn't get picked to be on the team for kickball? Um, and how did that make you feel? And does that or scenarios like that affect the way you kind of deal with loneliness or feel um, and act and behave now as an adult? So it's important to note that our fears um, may have been exaggerated as, as children, um, and this is pretty normal for kids. Kids have a lot of kind of dramatic and uh, irrelevant or over-exaggerated uh, fears because children don't like live in a logical, well-ordered world. They're still cognitively developing, um, and so when they come to adults and they say, oh, I have this fear of a monster under the bed, and the adult kind of brushes them off and tells them that's stupid, um, this doesn't make them feel validated and seen as a person and understood. Instead, it makes them feel alone in those feelings and isolated, and this can kind of increase those feelings of loneliness. Um, and so sometimes those feelings of loneliness linger all the way into our adulthood. Um, and also we have to think about the strategies that we used as kids to avoid feeling lonely. Um, and we might still be using those same strategies in adulthood just because they've become a habit and we're not aware of them. Um, and if that's the case, we need to see if those strategies are still important or, uh, I'm sorry, appropriate or not. Um, so, for example, do you, like, shut yourself off emotionally? Do you not open up to people in relationships because as a kid you felt lonely and that's how you protected yourself? Um, you may be doing this now out of habit even though it's, like, not necessary because... You might have relationships with people that love you unconditionally um, and appreciate you just as you are and, and might really want you to open up to them and so it's not necessary for you to close yourself off. Um, and so we have to kind of figure out what strategies we might be using um, that we developed in childhood to fend off loneliness and see if they're still appropriate as adults. So adolescents experience loneliness more than other age groups. Younger teens report feeling lonelier than older teens, um, and the more lonely teens felt, the more depressed they were, and also more likely to be suicidal. Um, and so common concerns that can lead to loneliness in adolescents are bodily changes, wanting to fit in, fear of rejection or exclusion by peers. Um, at this stage, we're, we're struggling to find our identity and also to be accepted um, as who we are. However, there's also a lot of pressure for us to conform for acceptance, um, which is ultimately what can make us feel really alone because we're not being ourselves. Um, and the, the reality is, is that for some adolescents that choose to not conform and really be themselves and hope to be seen as their authentic self in that way to not feel lonely, um, for, for a lot of people that don't conform, this can result in bullying or being excluded. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. One thing that we know is that uh, minorities often congregate together. They may internalize uh, racist stereotypes, which can lead them to feel different and alone. They may not know who they are, believe in their abilities, or really feel connected to others. 
Minorities often face cultural isolation. So cultural isolation is isolation from a larger culture within your proximity. And the isolated group uh, does not adhere to the cultural beliefs, attitudes, or norms of the larger culture. Um, and so they kind of stick together to avoid uh, feeling isolated by the uh, larger culture. Um, and so sticking together allows them to avoid that social isolation and the loneliness. Okay, for lecture activity two, do you remember a time when you felt lonely in childhood or adolescence? Maybe you felt excluded or left out um, or pressure to conform, which made you not feel like yourself, um, that you weren't being true to yourself, which could ultimately make you feel lonely. Um, and so do you think that this has any effect on your behavior in social situations or beliefs about yourself now as an adult? Um, so think about that if you have, if you remember a time when you felt lonely as a child or as a teen and then what effect that has on you now as an adult. Uh, give me two to three sentences on that for lecture activity two. All right, and then in young adulthood, uh, some of the things that make us feel lonely are, for example, our choices not being validated. So at this point in our life, we're like struggling with what we're going to do with our lives in terms of our career, relationships, are we going to have a family? And dealing with these choices can be a difficult and sometimes lonely process, especially if you don't have like a strong support system. And so um, not being validated for your choices, like when you do decide to go to college or when you do decide to, uh, you know, get an apartment by yourself, if there aren't people close to you, family and friends that are saying, you know, good job or I support you or, or you know, let's see how this goes, great choice then that can be a very lonely feeling. Or if you're in a relationship with someone and that person is very critical of you um, and every decision you make, they're kind of there to play devil's advocate or put you down, that's obviously going to make a person feel very lonely. Um, and so another thing that happens in young adulthood um, sometimes is avoidance. And so not dealing with your feelings of aloneness um, that you have maybe because your choices aren't validated has consequences. Like we've said before, those consequences could be depression, substance abuse, low self-esteem. So it's important in this stage to come to terms with yourself and to trust your inner resources, your intuition, your past experiences, your knowledge, the wisdom you've gained from uh, people that you trust. And so um, otherwise you may end up choosing relationships or a career before you are really ready. Um, you might look to other people for a sense of identity, which is really not possible. You have to find your identity in yourself. Um, and looking outward for your identity will just ultimately end up leaving you feeling more lonely. And then finally, lifestyle changes can cause loneliness. Um, so for example, if you are to go to college or move out of the country or get a job and any of these things take you away from your comfort zone or from a place you're familiar with or away from your friends and family, um, then these lifestyle changes obviously are going to have an effect on uh, your feelings of loneliness. Okay, so then in middle age, um, some common issues are that we may feel that our lives aren't really what we had hoped that they would be at this point. Um, and so some of the things that we may face are divorce or severe breakups, not being as successful as you had hoped at work, um, or your children leaving the home and having that kind of empty nest syndrome. Um, and so we may feel like we can't control some of these changes and we really may not be able to control them, but we can certainly choose how to respond to them um, we can choose how we react. Um, we can choose our attitude to, uh, the, our attitudes towards them um, and try to look on the bright side or try to be optimistic um, because change in life is going to happen and, and sometimes it does leave us lonely. Okay, so in our later years, um, we really kind of are impacted by society's perception of the elder we. Um, and so our society really emphasizes productivity, youth, beauty, power, 
And as we age, we may feel like we are losing all of these things, and therefore we feel disconnected from the rest of society, which can, or rejected or excluded, you know, and that can make us feel very alone. So as we age, um, we may feel like we're being put out to pasture, so to speak, and that we don't have any value to society anymore, or even if we feel like we have something to offer, we might feel as if society isn't interested or willing to accept it because of our age. So it's actually pretty common for elderly to feel hopeless if they feel like there's really nothing uh, left, to, left to look forward to for them in their lives. Also, as we age, we experience physical losses, um, like our vision may decline, hearing, our memory, our strength and agility, our reaction time. And so all of those things can also um, make us feel maybe less useful in our society and, and therefore more alone. Um, we also are likely to experience some external losses. We might uh, lose our job or, or retire. Um, we might lose um, friends or family um, to death or illness as, as they age also. And so it's especially difficult for elderly uh, widows to deal with their loneliness and with these external losses. Um, in fact, it's, it's common for one spouse to die soon after the other spouse dies, in part because of the loneliness. Um, so elderly people in retirement homes or uh, elderly people that are hospitalized can face some of the most extreme loneliness. Um, and I've had students that work in nursing homes tell me that at first family members will come to visit pretty regularly, but then for most of the uh, elderly people that are there, their family eventually just kind of stops coming. And so they have to build new social networks with the other elderly people in the home. Um, but they're always impacted by the limited visitation. Um, it, it really uh, contributes to their loneliness. But they also don't want to say anything to the, their family members because they don't want to be a burden on them. So uh, the bottom line for this chapter is that part of the human experience is loneliness. There's going to be times in our life that we feel lonely and um, during those times it's really about how we react and how we deal with those feelings of loneliness. And so maybe the best thing that we can do is try to uh, find the ways in which loneliness can benefit us um, and try to keep a positive and optimistic attitude about it. Um, make it a moment in our life where we can really become introspective and gain some personal awareness. Um, and if possible, try to be grateful for the opportunity to learn more about yourself. Um, because when we make time for ourselves, that aloneness can help us to find our center, to build strength. Um, it can help us to be able to relate to others once we're able to really understand ourselves then it's easier for us to empathize with what other people are going through or how they're feeling. It also um, kind of takes us out of our own self-absorption once we really understand what triggers our thoughts and feelings and actions. Um, then we don't have to spend so much time thinking about it anymore and we're confident in who we are as people and so we're able to give more to others. Um, so use this time to listen to yourself if you do find yourself alone and be sensitive to your experiences. Try not to be overly critical or overly judgmental of yourself. Um, try to kind of talk to yourself like you're a friend um, and, and give yourself time to go through the process of, of maybe getting to know yourself during these moments of solitude that perhaps you haven't had before. Um, so Maya Angelou actually schedules one day of alone time a month um, and, and actually her friends like know her schedule of when she's going to do this alone time and they don't call her and don't bother her. But ultimately she says that this makes her a better friend for the reasons I cited earlier, that she's confident in who she is and has a clear sense of identity. So she's able to give more to other people um, without needing as much from them. Okay, so that's it for this chapter. Be sure to submit your lecture activities 
and complete the assignments uh, associated with this chapter, and we will see you on the next lecture. Have a great day.